Galatians chapter 3. Galatians chapter 3. Uh, I'm going to start about verse 26 and read the rest of the chapter. That's only like three or four pages, uh, three or four chapters. I mean, three or four verses, I'm sorry. So, <clears throat> Galatians chapter 3, verse 26, I want to talk to you today about a covenant God. A covenant God. Colossians chapter 3, verse 26 says this, For you are, are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For as many... Of you were as baptized into Christ that put on Christ. Now, I want to, I want to explain a word to you. I love, uh, if you're new here, I love to know what that word means. If there's a word in there, I'm thinking, what does that really mean? Cole, I like to look at that, and I like to do a word study on it because that tells you. Because, you know, we, we've got a couple of translations from, from Aramaic to Hebrew and Greek and English. And so we got three or four translations here. Um, that has been passed down. So I want to know what it meant originally. And so this word, many, says, for as many... That means uh, most of us are saying that means a lot of people. But really what that word means, <clears throat> it, is a, it is a Greek word. It's hoso, and that word simply means whoever. That, that's all that word means. You could put whoever in there. For whoever of you were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Verse 28, there is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female. For you are all in one. Uh, for you are all one in Christ, in verse 29. And if, that's a big word, that's a big two-letter word. And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Now, I want you to understand when he's talking about in verse 28 that there's neither Jew nor Greek nor slave nor bond nor male or female. It, you don't get to, uh, this is not a politically correct verse. There's still male and you have a role. There's still female and you have a role. There's still Jews and there's still Greeks. There's still all kind of people. But it says when you get baptized into Christ, you become one. All of that stuff doesn't matter. Amen. What matters is that you're baptized into Christ. It doesn't matter that you're male or female. If you're saved, you're saved. You can be saved male. You can be a saved female. That's right. You can be a saved Jew. You can be a saved Greek. Come on. Amen. So I want you to understand it's talking about everybody. And verse 29, I will repeat again. And if you are Christ, that is a big, big word. And if you are Christ. So if you're going to participate in the promise, if you're going to enter into a covenant with God, you've got to be in Christ. That's the criteria. If you're not in Christ, then this message won't mean anything to you till you get in Christ. God can only make covenants with people that's in him, that's in Christ. He's a covenant-making God with people who love him. I'm in covenant with my wife because we are married, and she's female. Amen. And so if I'm in Christ, if you are in Christ, then you're Abraham's seed. Where did he come from over here in the New Testament? Well, what's happening here? I mean, we're talking about Abraham. He was way back over in the first book of the Old Testament. Now we're talking about him again. So you can be in Christ and be of Abraham's seed and receive the promise that Abraham was given to Abraham. The promise, the covenant. I like that. Because if you've ever what read what's been given to Abraham, there's something good in there. And that's what we're going to talk about, a covenant God this morning. Now, if you will, I'm going to read you a different translation, the NLT, which is the New Living Translation, on just one verse. Galatians 3.29 says it this way. And now that you belong to Christ, you are true children of Abraham. You are his heirs. And God's promise to Abraham belongs to you. Everybody say amen. amen. Say what Abraham had, I get. The covenant God made with Abraham, you get it. I like this. This is good stuff. This will turn you, this will get your tractor cranked right here. I'm telling you, this will. I mean, it can be dead and it's going to get you cranked up here. So, <clears throat> uh, if you want to, you can be flipping over to Genesis chapter 12. But I want to talk to you a little bit about uh, an heir an heir. Uh, the Bible says that we're an heir that also says that we're, we're co-heirs with Christ. And that's a different message because I am going to be on a series here. 
But if someone told you that you were an heir to something, wouldn't it be nice to know to what or to whom you're an heir? Because there's some stuff people want to give you I don't want. Amen. Amen. Uh, so, so that uh, an heir to Sam Walton will look quite differently than the heir to, uh, say, my throne. <laughs> A little different. I could adjust, but I can get there, Okay. Uh, the heir to the throne of England is going to look a little different than it is to the heir of the slumlord. Amen. It's a little difference in the heir. It, now, <clears throat> to be an heir, you've got to have an inheritance. Amen? Inheritance. Uh, most of the time, have you ever, anybody ever heard of living inheritance? My, 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 my parents hadn't either. Y'all get that in a minute. My parents hadn't heard of that either, but I'm wanting them to. There's this thing called living inheritance. In other words, while the person is going to give you something still alive, you get something. Glory to God. I've been talking to my mom and dad for a long time. Don't you want to see us blessed while you're alive? You ain't going to know it if you wait till you're dead. He ain't caught on yet. I'm praying for him, though. So there's this thing called a living inheritance, but 99% of the time when it talks about inheritance, somebody has to die before you get anything. I want to just tell you right up front because you're probably figuring out somebody has already died so you can have something. Somebody has died so you can have the very best that's available to mankind, to humanity today. Somebody has already passed on, but the somebody we're talking about that's passed on has already been raised from the dead, and he sits at the right hand of the Father, and he has a promise that if you put yourself in him, if you get baptized into Christ, that you too can be saved, and you will have an eternal home in heaven if you believe in Christ. Man, that's good. That's an inheritance. But that's not what I want to talk about this morning. I want to talk about something different. An inheritance. Amen. So Genesis chapter 12. Let me get over there. Genesis chapter 12. We're going to start somewhere in the first one or two or somewhere in that neighborhood. Amen. All right. <clears throat> Genesis chapter 12. Now, I want to tell you this. Um, when you look in Genesis chapter 12... All the way up to 17, chapter 17, Genesis 12 to Genesis 17 is about six chapters. Mingled through those six chapters, it deals with the covenant that God makes with Abram, who changes his name in the middle of this, by the way, to Abraham. Changes her name from his wife's name, Sarai, to Sarah, okay? So it's all about covenant <clears throat> that God makes with Abraham in these whole chapters. Now, I'm not going to read you seven chapters this morning. Arvel said, amen. <laughs> but I am going to highlight some things. You can go back and read 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, and 17 this afternoon on your own time. Amen. Now, in chapter 12, <clears throat> I'm going to bring out some things. I don't know how far I'm going to get. This is going to be serious, so we're going to be on it for a little while. So if I get to a good stopping point and it's uh, 3 o'clock, I'll go ahead and stop. <laughs> some of you said, yeah, I'm going to be stopped at like, I don't know, 11.30. That's another minute. <laughs> Chapter 12. Now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of the country and from thy kindred. Oh, I can see it right up here. Amen. Now the Lord said to Abram, Get out of your country from your family and from your father's house to a land that I will show you. Who's speaking? Did you learn earlier? Uh, and who's he speaking to? Abram, soon to be Abraham. So we can just put in Abraham. It's not heresy if you use Abraham right here, okay? It's, it's not going to be. You're not going to hell for misusing the, the names right here. You're Abraham, and so, so it works, okay? So God's speaking to Abraham, all right? We read early in Galatians that if you're in Christ, you're Abraham's seed. And the covenant that God made with Abraham, you get to receive. That kind of rhymed, and that's pretty good right there. So... Now that you know that. All right. Now this is, the, this is what God promised him. This is the covenant that God begins to make. <clears throat> and I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and I will make your name great. And here's the, here's the important part. And you shall be a blessing. So God's going to bless you. 
For what? To be a blessing. See, you can take what's been promised to Abraham. Now, now Abraham gets to enjoy on just part of this, and some of it you don't. Like, you're not going to be a, a, a great nation. <laughs> I don't want to be a great nation. I'm good with two kids and a couple of grandkids, or three or four grandkids, amen. I don't want to have all these kids running around. You know, can you imagine Christmas, Matt? We were at Christmas at my father's, and, and we had 41 people show up there. And I'm thinking, are we kin to all of these people? 41 people, and, man, it's chaotic when you got little ones and old ones. And it's like, you know, I'm at the age now where I'm saying, where's the Sunday afternoon after turkey and dressing snap? Where, where's that nap at right there? There's no nap with 41 people. I blamed it on my mother and father, okay? So Abraham was the father of many nations, but he says, you're going to be blessed. I'm going to bless you so you can be a blessing. Here's the covenant that we get to partake in. You're going to be blessed so you can be a blessing, okay? Now, I want to tell you there's two words, these two words, this word bless and blessing, they come from the same root word, barak, which simply, simply means to salute or honor or pay homage, okay? But there's something about the word blessing, it's a little different and it has a little different meaning and it simply means this, it's baraha, which simply says you're a source, it's a source of blessing, prosperity or gift or present. So let me say it again, uh, baraha means a source of blessing, so God has blessed you so you can be a source of blessing so that you can have prosperity. Again, if you're new, I'm not a prosperity preacher, so don't think that. But, but God is into prosperity. He, you can't bless somebody if you have, don't have things. We were talking about it earlier today. We go around mow yards in the summertime. Guess what? Somebody has to pay for the fuel, the tags on the trailer, the tires on the trailer, the lawnmower blades, all of those things. Somebody, you got to be blessed so you can bless others. And, Christ, and, and the Bible says, I'm going to bless you, and here's the reciprocating thing, so that you can bless others. It's important that you get this. God's not blessing you so you can hoard up. God blesses you so you can give out. Let me give you my illustration. I've told many of you this, and some of y'all, you just say, man, that is the greatest story I've ever heard. If you've already heard it, you just say, man, that's great. I use this illustration about a water hose and a water spigot. Water spigot's on the side of the house. You take a water hose, you put that water hose on that spigot, and you run that water hose out to a dry spot in your grass because you want it to look pretty. Amen. Or whatever, maybe you're filling up a dog, dog bowl or a swimming pool. But the purpose of the water hose is to get water from point A to point B, right? That's the only purpose of the water hose. But in the process of it doing it, it's doing its job, it gets wet. Same principle with Christ. He blesses you with finances so you can bless others. And in the process, you get blessed. That is so cool to me. You mean, you mean I can just do this and shove it on to somebody else? Yeah, you got to take care and manage your money. But that's the principle. I'm going to bless you so you can be a source of blessing to others. So maybe if you're saying, well, my finances are a little tight and I can't afford to give. Well, no more and start tithing. That's a form of giving. Come on. You, how many of you like the air conditioner today? You like the padded pews? Sure you do. All that stuff costs somebody is giving and somebody's receiving. You wouldn't go to McDonald's and order a Happy Meal and drive to Wendy's and pay for it, would you? No. They're going to want you to pay for the food where you got it. Amen. That's a side note. I won't even talk about money. So I want you to know those, those two words. It says, <clears throat> and you shall... So that's part of the blessing, number three, verse three. <clears throat> and I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who curses you, and in you all families of the earth shall be blessed. Now, here's typically what that verse is associated with, and it is true because we know Abraham is, is the father here, if you will, the hierarchy, of, and, and then we know that Israel is there too. And it's typically, that's the verse that is used, say, if you bless Israel, you're going to be blessed. But now Galatians 3.29 uh, says, but if I'm a seed of Abraham, and we are, then guess what? I qualify for people who bless me 
will be, it says, those, go back to verse 3, please. <clears throat> I messed you up, didn't I? I'm sorry. I will bless those who bless you. Uh-oh. My mama used to preach this all the time, talk to us all the time. She'd say, you're blessed because you've been around me and your daddy. And we're blessed because we was around your grandparents because they all love the Lord, see. It all worked this way. And because you, sometimes in association, if people bless you, guess what? He's going to bless them. That's a principle we don't teach anymore. Be a blessing to somebody. And in that process, you're going to get blessed. I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse them who curses you. Uh oh. Might want to re- re- rethink how you're treating people. Are you cursing them or blessing them? Because the end result is a lot different. Because the Bible says one day you and I, we're going, to be, we're going to be judged. Everything that we ever said or done is going to be judged. Every word or deed. Come on. Amen. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. How many families? Not, not just some. Not, not a certain ethnic group. Not just Israel. Come on, not, not, not just Turkey, not just America, but all families who do what? Galatians 3, 29, put their trust in Christ. Come on. There's that, that if, and if you are in Christ, you are Abraham's seed. Amen. There's the criteria. I'm, I'm, I'm teaching you something. If you can get a hold of it, it'll change your world. It'll change your life. It'll change your, it'll change your finances. It'll change your, the way you look at God. It'll change the way you look at people, how you treat people if you get this. Amen? All right. <clears throat> um, let's look at uh, Genesis chapter 17. Y'all be flipping to there, but uh, I'm, if you got your Bibles, you can go a couple of places. Uh, you know, I, I struggled with a lot of things um, this morning on this. But so, so I tell you what, let's, let's, stay in verse, uh, let's stay in Genesis 12. Let's go back to verse 1. I'm only, I just want to do it this way. Can I do it this way? I sound nervous, but I'm not nervous. I just got so much I want to tell you. Amen? Amen? And I, I want you to get it all, and I know I can't get it all in one service, and I'm trying to do that. But So just, Lord, help me just to give what we can, what we can handle. Amen? Verse 1 in chapter 12, God gives the instruction to Abraham what is going to happen. So in a covenant... When a covenant is made, there's some instructions. How many have you ever entered into an agreement with somebody? Now, I, I remember you used to shake a hand. I remember my, my dad shaking somebody's hand, and you just, that, that was it. It was done. It was done. I don't care if, you know, you lose everything. But that handshake, you know, that was it. Nowadays, you have contracts because you don't really trust somebody to do what they say they're going to do. And then you got another layer called a lawyer so that they don't do what they say they're going to do. Then you get a lawyer involved so that they'll do what they said they was going to do in the beginning. Wouldn't it be just as easy to just go and do what you said you was going to do? Well, God is that way. God's the God that says, when I tell you I'm going to do it, I'm going to do it. So God gives instructions on how this covenant's going to work, and we've read them. But first of all, in verse 1, he gives instructions. In verse 2 and 3, God states his part of the covenant. Do you know there's two parts to uh, an agreement? There's, if you're just getting a covenant with yourself, there's no need to have a covenant. It's just you. If you're in an agreement with somebody, you have a contract, you enter into a contract with someone, guess what? They got a part to play, and you have a part to play. Some of you ain't never bought nothing in your life, have you? <laughs> it's like, is that right? Yeah, these, you know there's 900 pages you have to sign to buy a car? That's a covenant. That's a contract. It says, I'm going to pay my part. And you're going to deliver me a vehicle that stated that it's going to have this many miles on it or zero miles. It's going to have four tires and a steering wheel. And, and they're going to list all these dings and stuff on there. And it, whether it's used with no warranty or new with a warranty and how long, it's an expression of part of the covenant. What's going to take place in the covenant? And God is expressing to him what's going to happen in the covenant. He says, I'm going to bless you. You're going to be a, a, a father of many nations. And, 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 and people that are in you, you're downstream. They're going to be blessed. And who blesses you, I'm going to bless them. And who curses you, I'm going to curse you. So forth. You get it? There's, a, there's some meat to it. 
fine print. The deal with God is he has nothing in fine print. He tells you right up front what he's going to do. If you do this, I'm going to do this. And you, as my daddy used to say, you can take that to the bank. Don't worry about his part. My daddy always used to say, son, you do your part. Don't worry about, don't worry about God's part. Don't we do that a lot? We think we're doing our part, and then we wonder if God's going to do his part. There's the first mistake. You're in a covenant with God, and he said he'll do it. He'll do it. God said he'll bless you. He'll bless you. Amen. Now, verse 4. I like this. Verse 4. We didn't read this, so I'm going to start with verse 4. So Abraham, everybody say Abraham, Abraham. departed as the Lord had spoken unto him. What did he do? If you read in the beginning, he says, Abram, get out from your father's house. Get out of that land. Remember, we read it. And he says, this is what I'll do. And so now he's, now Abraham is performing his part of the covenant. Oh, you told me to get out? Now in verse 4, Abraham says, and this is what it says about Abraham. So Abraham departed as the Lord had spoken unto him. And watch this. This is interesting. You need to get this because I'm going to make a point with this in a minute. And Lot went with him. And Abram was 75 years old when he departed out of Haran. Now, verse 6, drop down to verse 6. I told you I wasn't going to read seven chapters. And Abram passed through the land unto the place of Shechem, unto the plain of Morah. And the Canaanite was then in the land. The promise, if you read all of this before that, the promise was that he was going to give them that land. But there was a little issue. Somebody was already there. We think those people are nuts. When they're driving down the road and they say, the Lord said he's going to give me that house. Oh, he's one of them weirdos. He's one of them name it, claim it, blab it, grab it kind of folks. What do you, so was Abraham then. I bet he was thinking, I bet he wanted to go up to him in Eastern and say, uh, y'all know y'all in my house. Y'all farming my ground. Those are my cows. You really probably didn't do that. But here's the deal. You wouldn't move in on somebody that already lived in that house. The Lord may say, I'm going to give you that house. You may have to purchase it. I'm not saying give it to you without financing it. I'm saying the Lord may say, I'm going to live there. I'm going to live there. I had a few things that the Lord spoke to me earlier in life, and they've come to pass. I didn't have them then, and guess what? Somebody was already occupying where I, what I thought the Lord had told me that I was going to have, and guess what? I've ended up with them. Oh, preacher, I don't know about that. Well, just hang tight, watch. That's why I live there, amen? <laughs> Abraham passed through this land, and he realized somebody was there. In verse 7, it says this, watch. And the Lord appeared unto Abram, Abraham and said, Unto thy seed will I give this land. And there builded he an altar unto the Lord who appeared unto him. So he sees this land, and he says, I'm going to give it to your seed. Who's the seed of Abraham? We are, at this particular passage of Scripture, he's talking about the children of Israel. All of those folks is going to come out of under Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. And so, guess what? They did inherit it. How many of you know that? How many of you know that they still got it? If you read all this, he says, don't give it up. That's why there's such battle. Is that right, Doc? That's why there's such battle over there in the Gaza Strip and Palestine. Because he said, don't give it up. And the world wants them to give it up. And why? That's contrary to God's word. That's why there's such a battle over there right now. reason I tell you, say, what does that have to do with the covenant? Well, what I want you to know this is this. Why I told you this is this. You've got to understand that God can tell you what a covenant is and perform it. And you see it in God's word that builds trust that what God says he can do, he will do. What God says he'll do, he will do. If you do your part. So many Christians come in, and this is why God don't work for them. I just said that. This is why the Bible don't work for people. They want to come into the church house, get zapped some, some way, and say, man, that was awesome. Walk out of the door and, and six weeks later say, it didn't work for me. And do nothing between the time the Lord touched their heart, thinking God's going to do everything. 
God's going, he's God, he's going, he's going to do everything. Well, that's not what this says. If you're in Christ, you're Abraham's seed. If you're Abraham's seed, I'm going to make a covenant with Abraham, and this is what I'll do if you stay in me. But the minute you remove yourself from godly principles and, and, and doing the things God wants you to do, God doesn't break the covenant. You broke it. God's still right where he is. And the moment you decide you want to come back to him, he'll pick up right there. Right there. He picks right back up and moves on. But we think God's going to do everything. Well, I can't, I can't quit my drinking because the Lord hadn't taken it from me. Well, you've got to quit going to the liquor store and buying the newspaper. I just went there for the newspaper and the devil drug me right in. No, they sell newspapers everywhere. Come on, somebody. Amen. All right. Verse, um, let's, let's look over now. Let's go to, um, let's go to verse thir- uh, chapter 13. And let's look down at, um, okay, can, I, can I throw some, man, I, I feel like, David, I feel like today I'm a prosperity preacher. We're not taking up an offering. How many of you know we don't, we don't take up offerings and I don't preach on prosperity? Come on, some of my faithful LVA people. We got visitors here. I don't do that. But I feel like today, because I, I've said prosperity four times, I feel like, oh, Lord, I'm, I have some kind of sin going on here. But I want to show you something. Because most people that don't have money are mad at people who have money and they use the verse, well, you ain't going to get to heaven if you got lots of money. Well, I'm going to show you something. The very first person that God used, other than Adam and Eve, we find is Abraham. Let me show you what, while he's still Abram. Come on. While he's still Abram, before he got to Abraham. Let me show you what the Bible says. I'm just going to say this, and y'all can just do with it whatever you want to. You can put that in your peace pipe and smoke it. Here you go. In verse 2, chapter 13, verse 2 says, And Abram was very rich in cattle, in silver, and in gold. And the Lord made a covenant with Abram. And he ain't worried about all that. He's fixed to become Abraham. It's even going to get more crazy. Watch. Verse 6. Remember that guy that went with him? Y'all know his name? Lot. Lot was Abraham's nephew. Okay? And so he said he's going to go with him. And so look at verse 6, 13 and 6. And the land was not able to bear them that they might dwell together, for their substance was great so that they could not dwell together. They had a lot of stuff, that so much stuff that the herdsmen of each of Lot's and Abraham was fighting over the good ground and the fresh water. And said they had so much together that they couldn't even, they couldn't even uh, ranch together. We got to split up, man. We're so big. What a problem to have. Somebody in here needs to get that God wants to bless you exceedingly, abundantly above all you can ask. He wants to do that. Why? Not so you can hoard up and be rich, so that you can bless others. How many of you know right now, if I, if I had to give you a piece of paper, you could write down at least, at least five families that you could bless. With, I mean, not even thinking about it. You could do that. You need to get in the practice of saying, who can I bless? I don't care if it's blessing with $5 first. Bless them with the meal. If God sees you faithful doing that over $5, he'll give you $50. Come on. And when you do that with the $50, he'll give you $500. You say, well, you sound like a prosperity. I'm just telling you, it works. It's not prosperity. My son and them, we, we, they can tell you, at the end of the year, if we, if we see that we've made the right amount of bushels and we've done all these things on our farm, first thing I say on the radio is somebody's going to get blessed this year. Before I take a portion, before he takes a portion, before anything's done, somebody, we're thinking about who we're going to bless. I'm not telling you that so you can say, oh, that's great, Pastor. I'm telling you because the principle works. Because I am in Christ and I'm Abraham's seed and he's blessed me so I can be a blessing. Glory. Some of you need to get a hold of this. Don't you want to be blessed? 
Don't you want to bless others? Don't you want to be blessed in the process? Amen, then. You need to get a hold of this thing. Glory to God. Keep on right here. I'm going to take up an offering. No, no, I'm not. I'm not. I promise I'm not. Watch this now. I'm going to show you this. In verse, uh, thir- chapter 13, verse 12, how much time do I got? Oh, I got nine minutes. Glory to God. I told you I wasn't going to finish. Verse 12, uh, chapter 13, verse 12 says, And Abraham dwelled. Didn't he? Yeah, I see it now. And Abraham dwelled in the land of Canaan. Yeah. <laughs> Y'all missed it. While ago, the Canaanites was there and he was just passing through. Now he said he's dwelt. He done set up a tent. Where? Right where the Lord said, I'm going to give you this place. Now he made all of them still. This Canaanite's still there. He hadn't defeated them yet. But guess what? He just eased up on in there. He said, let me just sit up right over here. Some of you couldn't ease up to God if he sat down beside you. Come on, ease up to a blessing of the Lord. He wants to bless you. But sometimes you're waiting. Oh, he's got to drive them all out before I can get there. No. No. They need to be saved too. Bust up in this. How are you with Jesus? Say, the Lord give me this place. I know y'all don't like it yet, but this is going to be mine. Might not want to say that. Joseph tried that. It didn't work out too good for him, if y'all know what I'm saying. Abram dwelled in the land of Canaan, and Lot dwelled in the cities of the plain and pitched his tent toward Sodom. Verse 13, but the men of Sodom were wicked and sinners before the Lord exceedingly. Watch this in verse 14. And the Lord said unto Abram, after, say everybody say after, After. that Lot was separated from him. Say, Lot left him. Just a side note here. God makes a covenant with you, and there's people around you that can help you walk in that process. But somewhere along the way, some of those people got to get out of the way. Not everybody that starts with your covenant is going to end with, your, with you and your covenant. There's going to be some people got to change in your life. And so it doesn't mean that they're bad people. It says Lot was a righteous guy. He went into a wicked city. He was the only one, he and his two daughters, the only one got saved out of there. Come on. Doesn't mean that they're bad people. It just means that somewhere down, guess what? Some people are going to drop off of your covenant wagon. Come on, God makes a covenant with you. Just, Lord, I'm riding this thing till it dies. Lord said he's going to give you a horse, ride it till the, till the legs fall off of it. Come on. My, my. Some of you need to get this. Lord Jesus. I got to get through some of this. I'm going to hurry. I got six minutes. I'm going to make it fast. Ain't nothing ever been fast in my life when it comes to preaching, so... Watch this. <clears throat> Verse seven, uh, chapter 17. I'm going to try to get through it because if I could get this, well, shut up and let's go. All right. So verse 17. And when Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to him. Can y'all go fast and I'll do it. Uh, I like New King James better. Was 99 years old and the Lord appeared to Ab- Abram and said to him, I am almighty God. Walk before me and be ba- blameless. There's that if thing again. And I will make my covenant between me and you, and you will multiply exceedingly. He's just reiterating the covenant that we already read about over there in verse 12, uh, chapter 12. Then Abram fell on his face, and God talked with him, saying, As for me, behold, my covenant is with you, and you shall be a father of many nations. No longer shall your name be called Abram, but your name shall be Abraham, for I have made you a father of many nations. What verse is that? Five. We're going through ten. So let's keep reading. And I will make you exceedingly fruitful. And I will make nations of you and kings shall come from you. Now, if you do a study on that phrase, I will, I will uh, uh, go back to that five, six there. I will make you exceedingly fruitful. That's in two ways. We understand that he was fruitful uh, with cheerings. Come on. He's already been fruitful financially. We read that earlier when he was still Abram. He's changing his name right now. He was what? He had much silver, gold, cattle, right? Now he's used this word exceedingly. 
Fruitful covers a lot of stuff. It covers kids. It covers cattle. It covers land. It covers servants. All of the above. So, Pastor, I don't know if I believe that. Well, just read all, all this book here, and you'll find out how, how that did come to fruition. It's more than just children. But why is he doing this? you got to ask yourself, why does he want them? He's already got so much stuff. That's what most people, especially in the Christian realm, we already got so much stuff. Why is God blessing you? Because it's a biblical principle. He says if you got somebody that's doing something with it and managing it, and you got somebody that's not managing it, not doing anything, with it, take from him and give the one who has. I didn't come up with the principle. I'm just telling you what it says. Amen. Why is he? Because he's, look, he's faithful. We ain't even got to depart off an Isaac yet. Really? Yeah. Going to move into a whole new realm of faith then. This thing is just awesome if you read it and study it. Amen? Amen. All right. So um, I will make you seemingly fruitful, and I will make you nations. I will make nations of you, and kings shall come from you. Uh oh. How many of you know where Jesus came from? Abraham, he's the seed of Abraham. If you go do the study, Jesus, King Jesus, he said he's going to make a king from him. King Jesus came from him. Now do you believe when God says, I'll make a covenant with you, that he's going to stand by his word? If he says, I'm going to bless you and kings will come from you, I'm telling you, King Jesus came from Abraham. And if God says he's going to do it, he'll do it. It ain't up to you to figure out, I wonder if he's going to. He's not going to for you. You're just trying to figure out if he's going to you got to settle in your heart that he's going to. I've never been jealous a day of my life of my wife. I mean, <laughs> think about that just a minute. Boy, I wish she was in here. Man, I hope that's on back there. No, that's not just being funny. That's, that's just a lie. I've never been jealous of my wife a day in my life, nor has she me. Why? Because when she said, I do, I believe she said, I do. And when she heard me say, I do, I mean, I do, period. End of discussion. Well, preacher, you just ain't been married to the one I've been married to. I, that's, that's right. I've been married to that one. See, I don't doubt that covenant. I don't doubt the covenant that when the Bible says that if I come to him and I confess my sins, that I can be saved. And when I die, I'm going to heaven. I don't doubt that. You've got to settle some things in your heart. And when God says, I want to make a covenant with you and I want to bless you so you can be a blessing to others, you just go ahead and settle that in your heart that it's a done deal because God said it. If we can just settle some things in our heart, y'all, it'd be so much better. Um, and I would, establish, uh, I would establish my covenant between me and you and your descendants. Uh-oh, he's reiterating this thing again. See, he's established in the covenant what's going to happen. Now, we read it in Galatians 15, 1,600 years later. Paul's pinning all that down. Guess what? But, but God says this is what's going to happen to your descendants. Me and you, I'm going to make a covenant between me and you and your descendants after you and uh, you in their generations for an everlasting covenant. How long is this covenant going to last? Has everybody ever been able to get to the end of everlasting? No. Everlasting means from now on. Until Jesus returns, this covenant's going to stand between his descendants and the generations after them for an everlasting covenant to, to be God to you and your descendants after you. He says, I'm going to be your God to you and everybody after you. See, that's why I wanted you to read. That's why I got, had to get Galatians 3.29 in you. You're a descendant of the seed of Abraham. If you don't get that part, you think he's talking about Israel and that's all he's talking about. That is not true. This Bible is for every one of us today. Next verse, please. Okay, uh, and also, I give to you and your descendants. Boy, he's big on letting us know we're in that, right? This is like the third, third time he said it in two verses here. And also, I will give to you and your descendants after you the land in which you are a stranger. He's talking about, now he's talking about Canaan right there, right now. He is specific, okay? Hear me out. He's talking about that. Don't say, look, you ain't going in claiming, you ain't coming to my property and claiming mine. And all the, all the land of Canaan as an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. We hit on that a while ago. It's theirs for an everlasting. That's why Israel is still standing. 
Doc Russell, you, you taught us that, that it's a slither, about half of Arkansas is the size. Is that maybe not that much? About a third. This was the third size of Arkansas. And they keep them folks over there in the Middle East up on their toes. Do you hear me? How many, remember how many people live there? Nine million. Nine million. That's about uh, how many live in Arkansas? Three, and I think about that many in Mississippi and probably about that many in Alabama. Tell me, God, when he said, I'll make a covenant be for you and, your, and be for your descendants in this land, I'm going to give you. Tell me God reneges on his covenant. He don't renege. You know why? Because we read in men's Bible study in 2 Timothy that he's a God that cannot lie. Man, this gets me worked up. Y'all, can I go a little bit more? You okay? I got to get more than that. I mean, I don't know. So, so uh, and God said to him, as for you, you shall keep my covenant. You and your descendants after you throughout their generations. Oh, got to keep my covenant. We know what God's part of covenant is. I'm going to bless you to be a blessing. And I'll give you this land, but you got to do something. What is it? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. You got to fall in love with Jesus. You got to be in Christ, as Galatians said, in Christ. That's your part. That's what you bring into the table. Jesus don't need to make a covenant with himself. He's already got everything. <laughs> Isn't that awesome? My daddy, he would go to the bank, and he first thing he would do, he'd just get me all uneasy. He'd go to the bank, he'd say, I need to talk to the president. I'm thinking, president of the bank? I asked him one day, Dad, why you do it? He said, I don't need somebody to tell me that they got to take it to another committee to take it to another committee. I need to know, can I get the money or not? He wanted to know. And that's what, when you come to Christ, look, you can go to him and you can believe what he says, it's going to happen. You ain't got to worry about it. You ain't got to pray about it for seven years thinking, oh, God does it. You do your part, he'll do his part every time. Amen. This is my covenant, last verse. This is my covenant which you shall keep between me and you and your descendants. There it is again. Descendants. After you. Every male child among you shall be circumcised. Praise the Lord. Uh, come on, every male. You probably are, but we don't have to be. <laughs> Y'all are like, what is he talking about? I'm just glad I didn't know it when I got circumcised. Not like Abraham. He was like, what, 90, some 75, 90, whatever it was. I'm thinking, oh, no. Ishmael was 13 years old. Come on, think about that. Tell you what, I wasn't very big at 13, but my dad going to have a real problem right there. You hear me? That would be the second time I bowed up on my daddy. Whoa, partner. I like how they finally get the cross here. It's finally, y'all finally getting it loosened up a little bit, you know. It's adults in here. Watch this. I am going to hurry. I really am. In, verse, in chapter 17, verse 4, there was a covenant between Abram. Then it was then Abram, but Abraham. But in verse 7, he starts including me and you. You go back and read it in verse 17. First thing, it was in verse 6, he says, I'm going to make a covenant with you. I'm going to make your, your offspring. You're going to have offspring, and I'm going to make a covenant with them. Verse 7, the covenant is extended from Abraham to me and you. And in verse 8, he gave him a, a possession of land. He gave him some material things, church. He made a covenant. There were some materialistic things. Why? He knew that what he had Abraham poised to do, positioned to do, he was going to have to have a space, a spot of land. He's going to have to have something to work with. Well, I'm telling you, what God's got in store for this church is going to take some finances. Come on. What God has in store for you to be able to bless them is going to take some finances. Here's what I do know. Broke people can't help broke people. It, it, it doesn't happen. I'm not down in anybody. Please don't ever think that. Because I've been broke before. 
I'm just telling you that if you'll take what God's given you in the materialistic realm, you can be a blessing to others. And in the process, he's going to continue to bless you. In verse 4, I mean in verse, uh, verse 10, the fourth point was he, makes a, he marks a covenant. He makes a covenant. And he says, this will be the sign that I'm going to keep my covenant forever. Do you know that sign still around, that circumcision thing still around? Doesn't mean that you're out of the covenant if you're not circumcised. Please don't say, don't, don't, I, your pastor ain't saying that. I'm saying that sign that started then is still here. Come on, you think about it. I'm trying to get you to understand when God says, I'm going to make a covenant with you, he's going to stand with it. This is 2,000 years ago, 2,200 years ago. It's still happening today. So in order for us to go forward in what I want to teach you about the inheritance and what God has in store for you so you can grasp what, what's going on here, you've got to get today's message. You've got to understand that God is trustworthy. He's a God that cannot lie and will not lie. He's a God that says, I change not. I'm the same yesterday. I think 2,200 years ago could qualify for yesterday. I'm the same today. That's where you and I live. And to our descendants, he's, and to the Lord Terry's, he's going to be the same then. He's not going to change. Church, if we can get this in our heart and get this in our spirit, that he's a covenant-making God, and he's going to stand by his word, there ain't nothing going to stop us. There's nothing going to stop us. We're going to win souls. We're going to win souls. That's why one of these things has been put in place already. Well, basically, these two things I talked about. First, a starting point, next steps. So I was praying and said, Lord, I want to win some souls. He said, what would you do if they showed up, they showed up at your door? I told you this when I went to snow skin. And I wrote down, a, I got about a four-week deal of teaching. I was praying the other day, right over here. Early one morning, I said, Lord... I got my stuff together. I'm looking for these folks. He said, put it in place. Set a time. You get ready. Do you know what I'm doing? I'm just believing that God made a covenant with me and with all mankind that he wants us to be saved. He wants us to be born again. And when you get born again, it's going to be the church's job to come along beside. Our part of the covenant is to come along beside you and help you get from day one to day two to day three to get through those tough times, get through that when you got saved and your husband didn't. Come on. What are we going to do now? He's crazy and I'm better. You know, I got saved. Come on, somebody. This is real stuff, right? That's really what we're going to learn. We're going to, we're going to help you. But I'm telling you, the Lord's going to send souls. I've been praying to the Lord of the harvest in Luke. He says, you pray to the Lord of the harvest to send the harvesters. He didn't say, pray for the, pray for the, the, the harvest. The Lord of the harvest for the harvesters. Why? Because the harvest is ready. There's plenty. Each one of us know multiple people that if they die today, they're going to hell because they don't know Jesus. Let's get our stuff in order. There'll be souls that's brought into this house. But I'm going to make a covenant with God today, and I want you to do it with me. It's part of LVA Church. Lord, I just want to make a covenant with you that I'm going to do everything I can to win every soul that I run into. And, Lord, I'm going to help disciple them. I'm not just going to lead them to Christ and drop them off at the pastor's door or drop them off at the back door. I'm going to be right there with them. I'm going to go hand in hand. I'm going to say, Lord, I want to make a disciple because that's, all, oh, that's what we're supposed to do, Matthew 28, 19. Come on, it's your covenant. As a body of Christ, when you entered into Christ, he said, go make disciples. Your pastor's not telling you that that's a denominational thing. That's what the Bible says. So we got to start doing our part. What is that? What his covenant says. This thing, there's a new covenant and there's an old covenant. They're called testaments. Come on, somebody. Amen? Will you stand with me across this building?